Hello everyone, it's Rick Walland here. This is the third episode in my new podcast series and today I'm joined by John T. Aldridge, an English teacher based in Taiwan but with a background in music as a bass player. Here's a little preview of what's to come. No, I thought we were going to be called something like Finger Blast or <laughs> Finger Blast Masters. Just going back to some weird band names, one that I saw on the door because some lo other local bands would promote their shows on our college campus, and one of them was called Mel Gimp Suit, which I thought was a nice ring to uh, Mel Gibson. Going back to the Purdue thing, the best gig um, was actually in a town, was a primary school in Market Harbour of where, um, <laughs> I don't know how we ended up playing there, but I think it was just some... One of our guitar players maybe knew somebody who was also playing there or something. Don't remember the details, but we showed up there and it was rammed. It was like the entire school hall was just filled with like underage drinking teenagers. And you could see them all like passing around a bottle of vodka or something. I was like, this is going to be wild. And then because we were the only metal band, mosh pits just happened straight away. Some kid broke his nose. Um, so we had to clear, clear the floor with him. So we're driving to Market Harbour and trying to get out the car and uh, Jack's closed the door on my fingers. <laughs> and then he, because the door didn't shut, he just slammed it again. <laughs> like, ah! And my fingers were like flat. <laughs> Do you remember, um, I mean, Tom, Tom, Tom remembers me, but that guy, Mel, was it Mel Dean? Mel Dean, yeah. Yeah, Very you know, what a character. I loved him. Yeah. Uh, All right, we're gonna play. We're gonna play a song like this now. Okay. No. <laughs> it, I like how we just sit there at the piano and then hear something wrong and just not even look but just point and be like, no. <laughs> um, but Mel Dean would always say at the end of like most sessions, he'd be like, "You do all right. You will. You'll be able to play at bar mitzvahs and birthday parties." <laughs> If you're looking, that is some <laughs> that is some endorsement from from Meldine. Yeah, yeah. The last loan instalment, um, I was like, I need to do something wise with the money, <laughs> <laughs> not just buy bases and <laughs> MDMA or whatever it was. Yeah, <laughs> and then yes, yeah, so I bought a TEFL program and smartest fucking thing I ever did with the money. Well, it's not the only thing I bought. Did I tell you that I bought a 10-day trip to Japan with the last loan installment? I didn't know about that. No. no. I mean, that's a good way to that's a good way to spend your money, man. Like, I, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I call it my quarter-life uh, quarter crisis. <laughs> so I'm John, and I grew up in Melton Mowbray, Leicestershire, England, and then met you, Rick, in the fine city of Manchester, and then not long after, moved to Taiwan to do English teaching. You're from, you're from a place called Melton Mowbray, which is near Leicester, or it's in Leicestershire. It's in Leicestershire, yes, Leicestershire. It's about 20 minutes, half an hour by car from... Leicester City, but it's a town. It's a market town. And, Famous uh, for its pork pies. Yeah, the pork pies. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess we could start there. Like, I mean, how was it growing up there? And and when did you start playing music? And who were you know the bands that you used to go and see, the gigs that you used to attend? And well, it was great growing up. Lived on a council estate. Not a rough one, but certainly character building. And uh, yeah, there wasn't really much of a music thing. They'd have a special day called Melton Day where local bands might have been able to play. But there, there's like zero venues. There's probably like a few pubs and then a working men's club. I'm not sure if those are still there, but um, those were the places really. But my first band, we had our rehearsal space which was um actually a part of a club 
so we were able to like put our own gigs on when we were kids, like you know, fifteen or something. Eventually, um, but yeah, there was nothing really majorly happening in Mountain Mowbray. But my first gig was I went to see my guitar teacher's band. They were called Smuck, and uh, <laughs> they were they were metal, obviously, and they were awesome. <laughs> That was the first local gig I ever saw. So were you were you playing like did you start playing like bass guitar like yourself at, at that point or were you just going no, to gigs? I, no. I um I got into Slipknot somehow. Uh, I saw like a an image of them on a VHS tape in the local record store and then I it was four pound ninety nine, and I had no idea what it was. I was just one of those weird kids that liked horror films, and then, so I got that, and it was music. I was like, "Fuck!" Now this is manic, and then decided I wanted to. Play this guitar. is when we like you're buying like going to what HMV and buying CDs, those things that don't. <laughs> it was before exist CD, anymore. kind of the transition out of CD. So, um, oh, sorry, out of cassette tape, um, just as CDs became the uh the main thing so um yeah i got guitar lessons because of that and then another friend of mine got guitar lessons too my friend will hay and he and i would would just kind of like teach each other riffs every now and again but it wasn't until i was probably i don't know 15 somebody gave me a bass and then i got kind of playing that too and I just got on better with it I think and then when it came around to like finishing school and I'd played bass in a school band with some friends um my first band called Chime with uh some good friends of mine and then so the access to music thing was really kind of where I had to go full ball with bass because I didn't really do well at school so I didn't really get any GCSEs and then for some reason I ended up auditioning for this course and then they were like do you mind auditioning as a bass player and I was like I'd do a triangle if you want because an opportunity like that ain't gonna be too common yeah 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 this is the the thing where we met old air this is like this uh, dedicated music course like a you know like a I guess like a diploma or a B tech, was it? <laughs> it was to so yeah, some kind of national accredited diploma. I don't know what a B tech is. Is that for trades? Uh, I can't remember what it stands for. Because I, I, I did music at college, and it was a B tech national diploma in music practice. Um, oh, I'm not sure. Credit accreditation or whatever. But so that so this is in. Yeah, I had to take a bus there, and I was three hours early because. Yeah, I'm one of those people that has to be there early. <laughs> How did you find out about the this, this course? Then? I think it was connections. There was a like a, a recruitment thing for young people called connections, and they came and did uh, some workshops in my school to f figure out what we were going to do after school, especially for spazzers like me that didn't really have any qualifications at school, and then. I wanted to get into some kind of trade because my brother was very um, uh, logical and said you should probably do a trade because, you know, some secure work, and which was good advice. And I tried to be a plumber. <laughs> and then, yeah, that didn't work out because at the time it was just such an over-demand for that thing and it was hard to get uh, an apprenticeship and I'd gone to interviews to try and get some plumbing company to take me on as an apprentice whilst I did a day release at uh, college or something like that. So I knew about Leicester College that and then, yeah, so this Connections geezer was probably like, well, you got to be in music. You can probably go and do something in performance arts, maybe. And then that was all like open audition, though. So it wasn't based on your qualifications. I think that's what access courses are. Is that right? Um, not entirely sure, but um, I guess. 
So this this connection thing was was based in the job center. Is that where? You... Um, oh. It had its own office, but okay, I think separate it to would the... have done stuff with the job center eventually, and then it came to our school, and they gave him a corner of an office somewhere, and it was a very smart and very friendly man called Clive Newman, and actually I wanted to sounds get like into... a motivational speaker. <laughs> yeah, Clive Newman. He probably could have been. He was super cool. Um, I wanted well, to get he, demolitions. I guess he's there to like give people opportunities and you know young people who need a kind yeah. of step up into the real world. And so his advice was to go trade too, but then the ones that I were looking at because after plumbing was like there was a demo, a demolitions uh, contractor who was looking for like people to take on and. So I wanted to apply for a demolitions company because the idea of blowing stuff up and knocking down buildings was awesome. But yeah, it just never happened. So I had no real choice really to other than go for this music college because I took a year out basically. I finished school and then went to work for a year with my bandmates from school. Uh, we all worked in a factory and spent all well, our In Melton? Yeah, yeah. Factory, it was like yeah. a year before I went Leicester. Mm. And... Yeah, we just figured we'd get jobs, get gear, and then become rock legends. <laughs> but yeah, when you when you joined this this course in Leicester, access to music, I guess, is this when you started really kind of getting involved and you know playing in bands and? Yeah, because um, because when we called them and they were like, "Can you? What do you play?" It was like guitar, and then but I've got a bass <laughs> and they were like, can you come and do bass? Cause there's no bass players. And yeah, I was just jumping at the opportunity really. Cause everything else was going not so good. And then because there was like, what, I think it was something like f four guitar players to one bassist, like in our, in our college. So I ended up playing like in every band <laughs> pretty much. It was like three at a time. For each semester or something. So, so this is. <laughs> so did you did you? This is when you first met uh, Tom Fable, who was um, who did T Faz. T Faz, who did, did an episode with me um, not uh, quite recently, and this is where the connection between you and him started. Access to music yeah. in Leicester. Access to music in Leicester was where I met some of my best friends ever, like T Faz, Jack Ellis, and. Holly James, Owen Schofield, loads of them. And uh, yeah, we kind of just banded together and we sailed to Manchester <laughs> after a while. Well, let's, let's not fast forward. Let's, let's, so let's no, talk no. about this, time. your time fair. in Leicester and, and, and this course and, you know, playing in these bands and what kind of music were you playing in? All kinds of things. So like we, because I was basically just shoved into loads of different bands because there's no bass players. Um, one of my first bands was with Tom and and our friend Ollie, and I don't remember what they were called. But um, at the same time, they'd, in our first kind of like year group meeting, they just, they'd just put people together to make bands. And some, some people already knew each other and were quite clicky and made their own bands. But uh, yeah, so I got shoved in a band with Jack and given the name Skankadelia, which was the forerunner to the band that you've mentioned earlier. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, just a, a bunch of others. So I was playing quite a lot of different stuff. Um, I don't even know what our band was M with me and Tom. It was kind of like we played an REM cover um, and some, I don't know what you'd call it, like alternative rock stuff, if you like. I mean, I guess you were, <laughs> were you just doing covers or like a bit of both, like covers and, and writing your yeah, own songs both. as well? Yeah. I mean, Tom was like always writing anyway. He'd always have, they're all his songs, I think. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I got in in the second year. There was a metal band that I was really had the best time with. So there was a bunch of us. There was me, a guy called 
Charlie Lee and Max Hing and that Ollie James guy I mentioned before. He played um, the micro Korg in it. Even though he's an amazing guitar player, he played micro Korg in this, uh, I want to say Screamo band. I don't really know what it was. It was some kind of metally thing. And then there was another guy, Josh Kincannon, and a guy called Pikey who played probably the only person that I knew could play double kick on the drums. So, yeah, um, we did some pretty cool stuff with them. Um, just gigs. We had some, like, those were the, like, crazy gig stories we were always with them. They were called Purdue. Yeah, which I think is lost in f- French. I don't know. No, I've, I thought we were going to be called something like Finger Blast or <laughs> Finger Blast Masters. Yeah, like right off the bat, it was bizarre because like we'd in my old band called Chime when I was like 15 before uh, before we went to like, access to music, we'd um, used our rehearsal space for shows. Shows, it was just everyone was pissed up underage drinking and just a great time <laughs> um yeah so there there was like legit venues in leicester city so yeah and the, the college would have its own shows at one particular place and then outside of that on the weekends maybe after like six months into the course a lot of bands were just getting on it and just going on to like local venues around leicestershire and stuff and it was pretty rad um, just going back to some weird band names. One that I saw on the door, because some lo- other local bands would promote their shows on our college campus, and one of them was called Mel Gimp Suit, which I thought was a nice ring to uh, Mel Gibson. I never, I don't know what they were. I think they were some kind of like black metal thing, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I did, a, I did a covers a, a band in uni that was called. Mel Gibson, but that's, oh, really? that's better. That's better than the Mel Gibson. So it's the uh, play on words there. So where were the kind of the the main kind of music venues in in Leicester at the time? Like, where you where we you would say? There's one called the Shed. It's probably still there because it's like you can't mention Leicester's music scene without it. It's been such like a staple venue for like um, the local bands and stuff. Um, and there's there was one that was a venue called the Charlotte, and that would host some of like like national touring bands. Um, it was slightly harder to get a gig there, but it, we we did it in some form or another. Um, managed to play there. It's not there anymore, unfortunately. But um, and there were a handful of other places. Some some pubs would put on like live music nights and I think one of the first ever gigs I ever played outside of Melton with that band Chime was at something called The Victory which was just a pub we were this horrendous metal band with all the other bands were punk bands and they put us on, put us on first and so we just looked greebo-y and then there was all these geezers with like leather jackets and mo- mohawks and stuff it was just an odd, odd fit. Going back to the Purdue thing, the best gig um, was actually in a town, was a primary school in Market Harbour of where, um, <laughs> I don't know how we ended up playing there, but I think it was just some, one of our guitar players maybe knew somebody who was also playing there or something. don't remember the details, but we showed up there and it was rammed. It was like the entire school hall was just filled with like, underage drinking teenagers and you could see them all like passing around a bottle of vodka or something i was like this is gonna be wild and then because we were the only metal band mosh pits just happened straight away some kid broke his nose um so we had to clear clear the floor with him and then <laughs> yeah it's good time you and tom um we were hanging out a lot then uh going to the same gigs part of the same yeah me and tom scene. i think we kind of, we made, as we got more pally with everyone, um, we were in an indie band together called Detectives. And when we listened to a lot of the same stuff anyway, we both really liked Mars Volta. And we'd go see them in Burma. I think we went twice together, maybe, to see Mars Volta. I don't know. But we definitely saw them once. And 
yeah, we were in an indie band together, me and Tom, and it was a lot of fun. I think we did like three gigs <laughs> uh, at the shed. Do you remember this place that you mentioned called Stay Free? There's rehearsal rooms. Yeah, there's rehearsal rooms there. Those were, I liked them. They were cheap and they had, they used Behringer gear for the bass rig and it was just fucking loud. It was the loudest bass amp I'd ever played in, I think. I liked it. <laughs> One of them had like a, the floor, it seemed like, when you see a carpet in a, on the floor, it seemed like there was like maybe a load of like bed sheets, like duvets and things that had been deliberately carpeted over. It was like a mound and it was really soft, but it was carpeted over. It was super strange. I don't know what the hell it was. Um, that was the weirdest thing I'd ever seen. Just yeah, a, you, you a mentioned them, it mentioned that they were like um, old tax office. Like an old tax office or tax offices. To me, those buildings were just rehearsal spaces. <laughs> when you decided to move to Manchester and. So we did. The... Basically, I think it was about four years. So at the side, because it was like 50 bands at the same time that I was playing in, um, there was a band that I mentioned earlier called Skankadelia. Um, and that was the one that I think I'd got. That was the one that became less dramery, <laughs> and there, uh, yeah, we just enjoyed writing stuff there in that group. And that's the one with Jack. Jack Ellis was in that one. Um, so we still we did Skank Deer all that time, that four years. Yeah, I don't know where the psychedelic thing has come from, but I. I think it's a really good label to put in there because it is kind of an odd combination of styles. It's really like um, poppy, but it has a, like the scar element, which which I thought I thought it was just a good like mix of like accessible music that I thought could have been like that would have appealed to a lot of people and. Yeah, we did tons of stuff with them. Um, again, Market Harbour, for example, um, we did a radio interview show with some local radio presenter there. And there's a great story about Jack and my fingers. <laughs> so it was a heavy, heavy weekend. I think we'd played somewhere, like all of us. And we think we're all staying at Owen's house, the drummer's house. So it was like a always a mad weekend bender. It was away from Melton. If I was going to be going out in Leicester, it would, I'd be back in Melton on Sunday evening usually. So I'd be I'd have left on Friday morning and come back Sunday evening or something. So anyway, it's a, it's a horrendously drunken weekend. Probably been to some club or something, and then. So we're driving to Market Harbour and trying to get out the car and uh, Jack's closed the door on my fingers. <laughs> and then he, because the door didn't shut, he just slammed it again. <laughs> like, ah! And then my fingers were like flat. <laughs> uh, like just not doing broken or anything. Yeah, that's one of our favourite memories of the Skankadelia days that we talk about usually when we see each other and so yeah we just kind of did that thing for like uh probably four years and we got to play like the you know how college courses do like special events for like the course or the college or like the regional events and stuff like that we got to play a, a pretty big when i say big i mean it was like a a proper venue in birmingham called the barfly i'm not sure if they still have those anymore yeah, they had them all over. Um, and that was nice. It was good to see like how how stuff like in those kind of venues work. And then we played at like the college open days of once. Um, yeah. And so for after about four years, um, so it was probably 2006, towards the end of that course, uh, we had to think about what we're going to do after 
the course. And in February that year, my mum had died. So I wasn't in the mood for like uh, thinking about too heavy decisions, if you know what I mean. So I wasn't really going to go, oh, okay, yeah, so I'm just going to go do this course now or get a job or whatever, which I did have to get a job. Um, <laughs> went back to the factory that I worked at as a kid and then a Weatherspoons opened up. So I worked there for a bit. Um, yeah, so, and Tom had gone. Tom had decided to go straight there to uni and, and Jack and I were still like, we should do something, uh, maybe. Because I still wanted to write that music because I liked it so much and I think he did too. And um, So yeah, it all kind of came to a bit of a halt and then a period of about maybe best part of a year didn't really do anything and then we went to visit tom me and jack yeah slept in a corridor in john lester <laughs> on the floor it was probably the closest thing to train spotting as i'll ever experience so yeah we let jack and well sorry we let tom do the scouting for us i suppose um <laughs> Yeah, and then we got the good vibes from Tom, what he was saying about the course and how much of a good time he was having, and we went to see the place. Um, just he showed us what he was up to as a student there in uh, Salford. We didn't really see anything of Salford. We just hung out in Manchester mainly, and then yeah. um, I think we went to one of the student union things in. I think that might have been where I met you. That might have been it. Yeah. Um, it was, was, a, it? It was a Moho, Moho. It used to be called Moho Live or something. It was no, like, no, this was like a, oh. a university club night. You could only get in if you were a student, and I don't know how we got in because we weren't students. Was it? Um, do you remember if it was the city centre or, or Salford? Or it was on Oxford Road. Um, on Oxford Road. Yeah, and it was like, um, I think it was like once a month or something they'd put this club night on yeah and i think that was the only time i ever went there and uh, tom I'm will probably know i'm pretty sure it's moho live which was kind of like it's kind of yeah. like next to I... flex palace yeah i remember seeing you there in yeah. your band um uh, samuel, samuel sharp yeah uh can tom said my mate rick's the drummer of this band um, that's it yeah and then i remember that i don't know if i met you that night though um, but I think I might have met you on the year before, possibly, because there's there was a few people that I met later that remembered me from um, the the night me and Jack came to visit Tom, and I felt like a dick because I didn't remember anybody, <laughs> uh, which is not which is not like me. I do remember people. Um, yeah, so that's I just weird. I think um, you just like uh, you're just like a jolly guy and like fun to be around and just to have, have a good laugh sort of thing so that's yeah. always nice um, <laughs> so yeah fucking we went up there we did i got an audition <sighs> because that was a nerve-wracking bit it's like oh no what if we don't get in or uh something like that and that's our band fucked or i i had the intention of still writing that kind of music with jack and that's what we did eventually mm. we Reform. So after you after you visited Tom, you then decided, let's do this course. Let's do this yeah. course that Tom's doing, which is popular music and recording at mm -hmm. Salford University. Yeah, that, then we applied. We were like, okay, this place looks cool, because um, we met so many people that were like on that course in mm. your year, and then. It's like, it would be cool to get involved with so many people that are in the same thing. Um, well, that's what I thought anyway. And uh, the idea of going to university was kind of preposterous to me anyway. Like, I'm just not academically equipped. Um, mm. For example, like uh, on, on results day or like when we're handing in like uh, all of our work for the final thing, you know, I just thought I'd completely fucked it because they were like, you need to hand in all your scores and stuff. And so I've, I've gone there with like, a, I think I got a paper folder from like 
paper chase or something. And then <laughs> and I just shoved all my scores in that. And <laughs> one of them was like, why isn't this binded? And cause I could see the other students handing in these like binded scores. I thought they were books that they borrowed from their office or uh, something. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, they, can't, they, can't, they had like a I, shop on campus, like a professional yeah. like binding and yeah. everything else shop. And everyone was handing that stuff in. I was like, I fucked this so hard. Um, so this was your first year? No, no, this was a, in, I'm just talking about like me in academia. Like we're just not a fit. Um, I didn't get any GCSEs. Uh, in, in college and in access to music in the, I think it was the third year, they were, they wanted to know what we got. And when mm. I told mine, they thought I was joking. Cause you know, everyone was there with their like A's and A stars in, all of their subjects uh i wasn't allowed to take a maths gcse because i didn't do my coursework um just not <laughs> in, interested in school and shit so college came around and it was like music based practical so i didn't have to worry too much and i did well but then uni yeah. was a different ball game because you had to write essays and write scores yeah, and shit yeah um, it can be it can be a massive drag for some people they just want to play music and and then yeah. someone's I mean, telling them want... to, to read stuff about Adorno and Althusser and the death yeah. of the author. and That stuff now <laughs> I wish I could read again because I've become quite interested in like social science and like advertising and marketing and stuff. It would have been very useful for me now to have understood cultural theory a lot clearer. It's good. It is. It is good. Like semiotics and all that and ideological state apparatus and... Yeah, also one. <laughs> um yeah so i used because i was um the school always said i was a dyslexic student um so i was able to get like leniency in me not wanting to try write essays <laughs> basically uh, Play that card. yeah yeah and um i got a free laptop out of it so so i wanted to ask was like when you moved to to, to well salford or manchester uh, i guess salford Yep, so Salford. Where, where were you living initially? Moved to Bramwell Court. Okay, one of the halls of halls of residence. Yeah, I mean Jack, we're in, Jack and I were on the same floor. Um, we didn't get the same flat, which was pretty probably a smart thing. You know, when you like live with a friend, and it's kind of like, oh, yeah, eventually it's, like, it's different. Isn't it? it's, yeah, exactly. yeah. I don't know. I've never lived with um, Jack. I did live with my friend Dave, Dave Bolchin, in my third year and the year oh, afterwards. I've, he's got, I've got a question for you, but that's that's for later in the Q&A section. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> from Dave, so, from Dave yeah, Bolchin. Um, How did you find Manchester yeah. then, in, like, compared to... I, mean, I asked this with, with Tom as well, and he said he was kind of... Yeah, he kind of struggled a bit initially because it was much much um, bigger city and stuff. And Yeah. yeah what, was, what was it like for you? amazing like i just because i didn't know anything about being a student um i made some fucking huge like mistakes in the very like beginning not understanding how student life worked and stuff which turned out to be quite good because uh yeah uh so i had to go and work in my first year because of the way that i fucked up my financial planning if you like and mm. i mean i've worked at weatherspoons before and was like i'm never working in the pub again and then i ended up getting a pub job which was the best fucking job i'd ever had i think <laughs> the ape and apple the, the ape and apple yeah seems it seemed like everybody worked there <laughs> yeah i got i just went flyering my cvs because i needed to do something about that so yeah they just called me in for an interview and were like can you and my interview was basically sampling beer oh nice <laughs> there you go. yeah and then yeah and I, <laughs> I stayed there for ages i was there for like the whole time i was a student and then some really liked it um it was the boss there like she was very nice mm. like a good friend like an older sister kind of figure you know yeah yeah uh, I, th I think i met her a couple of times yeah she was like the land landlady yeah. Yeah. Had a had a lock in there. Legend. I think. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah I, think would... we, I think I joined one of the lock-ins like one time, and it was it was, it was cool. <laughs> it was cool. Um, yeah. 
So what about the course, like popular music of recording? Me and Tom spoke a bit about this and like, I what, really how did you find it? <laughs> yeah, I loved it. Like um, the first year, um, I was just eager to like learn things like, because my electives were composition and the pathway I took, you could take two pathways, right? You can go the technology route or you can go, um, did they call it pathway A and pathway B? Is that yeah, what they called right, it? Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah. Was pathway B, was that, that was technology? Re- that was recording, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, being a sound engineer essentially and learning about all yeah. that. And pathway A was session musicianship. Yeah, so that's what I did. Session. Basically a, um, a, a microcosm of, of, of the session <laughs> player world. So you yeah, learn to sight read. Yeah. Uh, do you remember? Um, I mean, Tom. Tom. Tom remembers me, but that guy Mel was it Mel Dean? Mel Dean. Yeah. Yeah. Very now, what a character. I loved him. Yeah. He, uh, <laughs> All right, we're gonna play. We're gonna play a song like this now. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> it, I like how we just sit there at the piano and then hear something wrong and just not even look but just point and be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he, used to, yeah. he used to show him like he used to be like you know you know like a part a drum a drum section he'd come up to it come up behind me and point at the score and he'd be like right you play like this okay it's a, it's a triplet okay so it's like diggly boom diggly boom diggly boom it's just <laughs> it's just um, yeah. what a guy and um yeah he used to do that to me come around like, you want to slide into this one <laughs> um I think that was I a cool it. thing about the course. There was loads of like like proper characters, like yeah. Um, there was jobbing musicians that were teachers. That was the cool thing. That's it. Yeah, they weren't yeah. out and out lecturers, like university lecturers. They were just basically musos. Yeah, who were like and that's what you wanted. Yeah, people do it, <laughs> and the fucking cold hard reality of what what it's going to be like. And Mel Dean was the one who. Well, here's the thing, like. Before we even went to college, I pissed around with like teaching um, mm. in my local music shop where I learned my guitar classes. Um, I had one student there um, to teach bass to, which turned out to be a good friend of my dad's. Um, so I had like a one bass student at my local music shop and then would occasionally, I did an odd function gig with some of those cats and a, a guy called Will Hay, who I told you about earlier, who's now like, um, he does actual session work sometimes. And some of his guitar licks are all over like, um, on like Sony, Sony's record label. Oh, I nice. forget the guy's name, but he played guitar on some, I want to say a neoclassical pianist. I don't really know the guy's name. I can't remember. Mm. But yes, yeah, so legit work. And he teaches a lot still. And so he's, pretty much stuck with that like yeah the legit work of a musician um so yeah i didn't i could have gone a lot more into it but i just i don't know man it wasn't for me i don't think you know like the teaching thing and the the function work Mm. there was life so big there was other things i wanted to do as well like Mm. that's why i ended up here um so yeah, I went purely for the compositional thing because session musicianship was great. Um, I learned to read so fast and mm. because I didn't know how to read properly and you kind of get shoved in there and they're like, is, well, you, you it... need to read or you're not going to be able to get any good scores. It's kind of redundant nowadays. I mean, if you work on the ships, because me and Tom talked about working on the cruise ships, as a what was it like a, he called it like a i can't remember the exact terminology but like a, a like a theater musician so you're playing in the kind of show show bands yeah mm-hmm. that in that case you would be sight reading so it would be very useful to be yeah. able to sight read but other than that i can't really think of a real life scenario where you would actually be sight reading yeah, because no, in session, I used to get in trouble because I, when I'd write parts for other instruments, because it was like a bass player, a drummer, 50 guitar players, um, and Mel Dean would be like, oh, you've got 20 minutes to get this song together. Uh, yeah. 
I wouldn't even bother writing like key signatures. <laughs> what I'd do is I'd write the chord, the one chord of the of the key, hmm. to save to save guitar players from. Uh, okay, so there's uh, what key's got three three flats in it, and then think about the the key, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I just write the one chord, whatever it was. <laughs> so it just then, yeah, just kind of like. Um, yeah, what's so the, now you got to write the three flats or whatever it is. What's the <laughs> in, in the jazz terminology where you just kind of playing around the same kind of uh, melody, like the head? I think they call it the head. We you, you know the main the head kind of tune. yeah yeah the main groove, the main like riff, and then after that you just kind of improvising for. Oh no, it wasn't like that. We didn't do much improv uh, because, well, I didn't. But some some cats had uh, sections where you had a lot of freedom to do stuff, and they'd call mm-hmm. it out as well. They'd go around the room and be like, "Okay, so on the third time round, it'll be like a bass solo." Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, we did that as well. It was a bit, I found Correct. it a bit weird. Yes. Like, I was like, you know, I just I wasn't interested in playing like at Matt and Fred's. Um, nothing against the place or or people that like are into that sort of thing. It just wasn't for me. Um, mm. But learning to read and navigate through scores was great, and I kind of been shocked myself at how fast I learned it. And because mm. all this time I was like, "Shit, I'm gonna have to read music," and I've never learned it before. And <clears throat> it's all right in the end. Um, but Mel Dean would always say at the end of like most sessions, he'd be like, "You do all right, you will." You'll be able to play at bar mitzvahs and birthday parties <laughs> if you're lucky. That is some <laughs> that is some endorsement from from Meldine. Yeah, there. yeah. It, it, I'd completely like screw up half the the session, and they'd be like, yeah, you "Do all right, you will." That's good, the weird. They just yeah, they just <laughs> they just had a really weird way of thinking. Like, I don't know. They, I guess, the conventional like players who who were doing all the kind of you know, showmanship and virtuoso stuff, they might not think too much about them, but, but then they'll just pick one person out, like you said. Like, you've got star quality. <laughs> yeah, You're going to be a star. Like... <laughs> so eventually I took, like, a few more students. Um, mm. I never really had, like, a, a load of, like, students to teach, so I, that was my income or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uni- so, so at university, you were also uh, teaching like one to one, like bass. bass not until way later on. Later on. Um, yeah, um, and so I think one or two of them. There's probably two or three people, and I think the two that were, you know, shown to me were uh, actually auditioning to go on the course. I think because they opened up a different course. I think, and they, it wasn't the course that we were doing, it was something else. Um, hmm. It was like a, maybe it was like a, some, some kind of foundation course. Yeah. Was yeah. Go on I, I did a foundation course, yeah, a uh, foundation year. It's like one year before the undergraduate um, course. It's kind okay. of like a, if you're a bit, if you're a bit like shaky on your, on your, your music theory, for example, They'll, yeah. they'll kind of use that year to kind of get you up to scratch and then then you can then you can kind of yeah. get onto the actual degree three year degree course and that's what happened <laughs> with me anyway uh, yeah i feel like that's what should have happened with me because when i did my audition they were like yeah you got you can play well but like your reading is gonna be yeah. a real struggle for yeah. you and i don't know it was a good choice though because I remember just being like, Jesus Christ, I learned that pretty fast. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess yeah. it's like a, a language in a sense, isn't it? Like sight reading yeah. is another language. You know, you're just seeing these shapes and images and, and whatever and dots and lines on a page. And and because my electives were like composition, um, I was still writing a lot with like Sibelius. And <clears throat> so it was very... I was just doing it all the time. I think that was the thing. Yeah, yeah, just enjoying um, it. I guess, I guess you know, yeah, if you enjoy it, that makes it. Um, so whilst we were there doing the course, um, Jack and I were planning to reboot Skankadelia. 
<clears throat> okay, so and, so they were put on hold when you both decided to move to Manchester. It was like put on the yeah, back burner I mean, for a bit, and then the drummer he'd gone to. Um, I can't remember if he took a year out either, but he, I think he went straight to Coventry University straight mm. after access to music, uh, and. Owen was just such the perfect drummer for that thing. And yeah. one of our best friends. So, and the cool thing was when we decided to kind of revamp that stuff, me and Jack would write a lot. Um, I'd just send Jack baseline ideas and he'd be able to just develop songs out of them. And so, yeah, most of it was just his, he had a really good knack at, um, Right in that style of our of our favorite music that we liked to write together or whatever. But then the cool thing was, Owen's finished uni, and he's moved to Manchester. Mm. So we had our drummer back, and yeah, we got some new cats, a new singer, new guitar player, and the style kind of changed a bit with a lot more it's like synth elements to it, and it was a mutation, if you like, and it was really fucking cool, and I liked it a lot, and then. So yeah. at, at what point did it become Mysterians? Well, Jack was against the idea of calling it Skankadelia because uh, he had um, didn't want all the the fiascos of the past to taint uh, the future of it or something. Yeah, um, yeah. wanted to so be a, could... a new project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but it was pretty much the same approach same style kind of and then like i said it, it developed a little bit so he was probably right call it something different because it's a bit different hmm. so the mysterious band name there's a we were just brainstorming one day and then i found a a japanese sci-fi movie called the mysterians and it was made in like i want to say the 60s and it was about like an alien race that had come to earth and it stated that it was going to just occupy a small part of land so that they could live there with the humans. Mm. But um, <laughs> they ended up like abducting women around. Uh, and then there was some kind of war between the Mysterians and, and the humans because they were abducting women. <laughs> <laughs> sounds, a, sounds a bit like Scientology. Some weird, because that's the, the basis of their religion is, or, oh, you know. Like these, yeah. these aliens come in to, you know, <laughs> take over yeah. whatever. But, um... It was wicked. like um, the 60s um, special effects of women being transported up a beam of light into a UFO. Just really like B-movie, like kind of. Yeah, There's, like barely any clothes really... on them. Just... <laughs> <laughs> just terrible effects, like really out, like old. Fucking... And it was like pure like Japanese pervy innuendo. <laughs> like what they were going to be doing with those women, and yeah, they, they have a quite a, a weird look, weird view of 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 like sexuality and and, and all that kind of stuff. So they, so. they put stylizing stuff. Um. <laughs> but uh, yeah, good. so um, how? So I mean, I guess you come into we can we can say we're coming to the end of your course, and so you're playing in Mysterians, you you're teaching a bit. You working at Ape and Apple? Mm -hmm. Now the other thing was <clears throat> performance royalties, which not a lot of I didn't know anyone that was getting them. Like because that Tom Hingley was it? Who was it? Tom? Who's the business Tom teacher? Tom Hingley. Yeah, he's the he was the vocalist for a really big kind of Britpop band called In Spiral Carpets. Yeah, yeah. So he was on about them. It's like if you're not with the PRS, then you're not gonna like. Well, doing basically so i joined the prs and yeah so I, I played again i was still in loads of different bands i played like with a guy <clears throat> called jules benji who plays some reggae stuff and then there was some woman from hong kong who was a solo singer played with her and wrote with her as well so i had always had a few bands on the go but mm. mysterians was my main thing and mm. yeah so was able to like teach a bit and earn some performance royalties from the PRS from the shows that 
we did with those other bands and stuff. Um, so when you talk about like music career, <laughs> um, those are your bread and butter things, aren't they? Like teaching and function work. And I, yeah, I wasn't that bothered about them. So I didn't pursue them. <clears throat> and then coming down to like promoting bands and stuff and mm. Like, I think it was just, I was having different ideas about, like, um, how you're going to promote a band and realizing that I don't want it to drag on for, like, five years and then it just disband. Um, like I said before, I'm, I need, really need, like, plans A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and H. <laughs> yeah. So, um coming back to what I'm going to say was plan B. <laughs> um, my ex-girlfriend told me about um, the TEFL thing, teaching English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. So with my, what was it? Yeah, my last loan installment, I used that money to buy some TEFL training. So is this, is this, so th this is post university now we're talking post university yeah, on our way out. Right. So, um, the last loan installment, um, I was like, I need to do something wise with the money, <laughs> <laughs> not just buy bases and <laughs> MDMA or whatever it was. Yeah. <laughs> and then Yes, yeah, so I bought a TEFL program and smartest fucking thing I ever did with the money. Well, it's not the only thing I bought. Did I tell you that I bought a 10 day trip to Japan with the last loan installment? I didn't know about that. No, no? I mean, that's a good way to, that's a good way to spend your money, man. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I call it my quarter, uh, quarter life crisis. <laughs> clip, that, I was man, clip that. That's going in the highlights, mate. <laughs> Yeah, so I got the last loan installed because our course finished early, right? So we had like a few months of like finish the work and the other courses that weren't music were still, you know, plugging away and mm. deadlines ready and we'd done. So come May, we still had like two months of official term time, mm. which we weren't doing anything with. So, and I was like, there's no chance I'm going to get this amount of money again. Um so this is what year is this? Two thousand and nine or eleven? When it when I think we? Two thousand and eleven. Two thousand eleven. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Can find pretty good at dates uh, or people's age or birthdays. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So I was like, "Fuck it, I'm going to go Japan because I've always wanted to go." Mm. Uh, so I just booked. I think I remember plate. you going. Yeah, I remember you messaging me like, <laughs> to tell me about it and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so that was it. My last loan installment was like, right, I'm going to go to Japan for 10 days and then treat myself for finishing my course yeah. and then came back, bought the TEFL course and then with the intention of going to Japan to teach and then having seen Japan and, you know, getting involved in a TEFL scene, if you like, um, realizing that Japan probably wasn't going to be the um, place of choice um why was that because the recruitment processes were very very like, f fiercely competitive and mm. i mean i'd applied for a few different places taiwan and like i think south korea um never china never appealed to me but um it was south korea uh japan taiwan and maybe Thailand mm. but um so yeah basically this all came around because I needed to have a backup plan because I had a feeling about like the pursuit of Mysterians and my future and stuff um trying to make right decisions for a change <laughs> um or at least smart ones <laughs> so um yeah so I've got 
this company in Taiwan were just like, yeah, just come over. You can have a job with us. They didn't even need to interview with them. And then the company in Japan, the reason I wanted to work at this specific company in Japan was because Takeshi Kitano was the endorser of this company. And he, I think he sent his daughter there or something. And I was like, cool. Takeshi Kitano is the shit. He makes great films. And I love Takeshi's Castle. You ever seen Takeshi's Castle? I was going to say, I, I, I hadn't heard of him, but I assumed he was he was yeah. the, the, the name behind that, that program. Yeah. Uh, so he, he made that and loads of wicked films. And then, yeah, but they recruited in the country of the native speakers. So they came to London for yeah. recruitment days and you had to apply to go to the recruitment day. And it was in London and it cost everything I had to go to London on a whim and stay uh, in a hotel for a night and do a two-day recruitment thing. And it was just fucking brutal. Um, I was like, you know what? Fuck this. I was like, fuck these guys and fuck everyone here. And just went dossing around London. <laughs> for the um, Yeah, London was great for the first time. Um, been twice and don't want to go again. Yeah. So yeah, at the same time, I was like, right, fuck it then. If I worst comes to worst, I'll just take this job I was offered in Taiwan and don't know anything about Taiwan. And um, yeah, the rest is history, just, as they say. I, sh- I did the last gig with Mysterians, and there was a nice thing about that because long time ago, back in Leicester College, we had a friend of ours called Matt Willars, who was actually a second guitar player in Skankadelia, and he he was actually a bass player. Um, I met him. So, yeah. Oh, you did? Yeah. I met him once. Okay. Yeah. So he came with his band to play in Manchester, and they were quite, um, they had quite a lot of following, or at least some buzz around them. And mm. then that was the last gig I played was with their band, um, somewhere in the northern quarter, I think. And then it was literally like a week later, I was flying here. Jetting off to Taiwan. <laughs> yeah, and that was kind of like, on a whim, I had like 300 quid on me to spend, <laughs> not really known anything about Did you Taiwan. take any like equipment with you, like your, like musical instruments or anything like that? No, I sold most of it to afford to get here. And so I was able to get the flight and then a bit of spendy to like yeah. try and time. Because the company had put me up for a night and then was shipping me out to the the town that I was supposed to be living in mm. and then yeah not realizing it was going to be like a month or so or two before I started getting on the payroll and yeah and the lift. so I was very lucky in a way because I was able to there was some woman who worked there and she was like you have to come and stay with me because the hotel that they want to put you in um you'll have cockroaches crawling all over your body while you're asleep. Oh, she, she did that. She went to the hotel that they put them up in and she basically cried her way out to go and stay with the the then academic director of the school's house. <laughs> and she said, <laughs> if anyone is coming to work at this branch, just send them to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Not the fucking uh, cockroach, the nest of the yeah, hotel. Uh, but yeah, I stayed there for ages, like until I got uh, on the payroll and gave us some money, and then found my own place in the a bit out of the a bit out of the city. So this, uh, what year would this be then? Now we're we're up to like 2012. The end of 2012, yeah. 2012. So we had basically a six month period after leaving the course, I think. Hmm. Was it or a year and six months? I don't know. Can't remember when I graduated. Twenty twelve. You can't remember yeah. when you graduated. <laughs> oh jeez. I remember graduation just being a blur. It's like Have you still yeah. got the, the, the certificate, the piece of yeah. shiny, yeah, yeah, just... glossy, embossed? <laughs> you yeah. need that to apply for like work permits and stuff in other countries. Oh, so so. It's actually it's useful important. then. Right. This yeah. is the other thing. It's like my plan was to make my time there useful and use my degree for something that was your right. thinking you were like yeah yeah like, okay because i knew it was going to be dog shit like i knew i wasn't going to get a fucking stable job in 
working as a musician. And so I wanted to just sell out with Mysterians and become a pop star or something. And then yeah, when that kind of showed signs of, um, what should we say, stagnation. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, newer. I couldn't afford it, basically. There's no way I'd have been able to afford to have stayed there doing it for that long. Yeah. Um, Because I don't have the... I don't want to say safety nets, but, like, the the right secure... This right um, backup support, if you know what I mean. Yeah, Um, you didn't didn't really have a backup plan in, I guess, in the UK or in Manchester. Yeah. uh, There's not much of a support system for me financially. (laughs) So that's what it was, mainly. It was Um, was a kind of you had to make a decision, like, fucking... Do this because there are other things I wanted to do. Go to Taiwan, you know. I knew from a very young age that I was going to live in Asia. Weird, weird thing. I was like, why? So how did that? How does that come about then? You just was it like a a, a fantasy or like a like a dream or something? When I was a kid, not not a lot of people know this, but when I was a kid, I was very interested in martial arts. My dad was like, um, very supportive of me doing like martial arts things he would let me watch all the john claude van damme films and yeah so i got into martial arts very young um he took me to like muay thai lessons when i was like six or seven and then from that kind of developed my interest in like feudal japan i just wanted to be a ninja and then yeah and when same, i was a kid same. yeah <laughs> wanted to be samurai a ninja. Or a ninja. <laughs> um, and that's what my childhood was like it was just based on like having a fun time and just being a ninja and for some fucking reason dude like i got into aikido when i was probably um i want to say 16 and i stayed with that right up until i moved to um manchester so i became i was like one i was in talks with the teacher about taking my first dan grade um but there was some like things that I needed to do. I need to buy a sword for one, which I couldn't afford. Um, and then pay for the grading itself, which I also couldn't afford. And my mum was very sick. So mm. it was just a shit, shit time and thing. But all yeah. this time being so like into being a ninja that I just knew I was going to live in Asia somewhere. It's like one day I'm going to live in Japan or something. Um, yeah, so it's fucking weird. But also another thing was we were a host family for international students. And so I met a lot of people from like China, uh, Hong Kong and stuff. They'd just so come and stay with us for fam- half. Your family home in, in Melton Mowbray yeah. uh, used to host. Huh? Uh, so I'd met loads of people from Asia. I'd learned how to use chopsticks very early. Uh, <laughs> that's great that Just, I didn't know that that you hosted uh, yeah so they were like students from were, yeah. why were they were they studying in Leicester or something or no, um, they would be going to boarding schools some of them are in Leicestershire some of them are in like Rutland some of them are like as far as like Exeter and stuff like that and so there's a company in Melton called uh, Students International and they would offer these homestay experience programs for um so you don't just produce the- pork, pork pies you you do other things as well you know <laughs> yeah we start with cheese it's one of the original uh authentic <laughs> origin places for Stilton cheese and we Stilton do cheese student stuff. and um yeah international students uh, oh, exactly. yeah, program <laughs> uh, yeah it's just an experience to for um, students who are staying in boarding schools and because we have things like half term holidays which they don't have in Asia um, so when the schools are closed the parents just pay this students international company to shove them in people's houses like mine and it was so fucking cool like there was one guy from from Taiwan actually um called Max and he was my age and so for the summer holiday <laughs> this kid from Taiwan was staying at my house and he was coming out and hanging out with me on the council estate 
that's yeah. some um, <laughs> yeah, cultural, all day. cultural appropriation <laughs> there for a Taiwanese yeah. guy. Uh, and it's at that age when everyone's like trying to start smoking and stuff and you're just like here's my he's mate like... Max yeah he's yeah. from Taiwan around here obviously <laughs> um... yeah, yeah it was so fucking cool man like people were just just getting somebody from a completely different culture hanging out with us in and the mad shit that we got up to in Melton Mowbray it was just bizarre but it was cool <laughs> Just a nice, yeah, nice kind of. Yeah. Don't know what the word is, but Just a different games. It kind of, um, it was like a balancing element having some guy from a completely weird. different culture and. Yeah. Um, there was one guy from Shanghai who, because uh, the Chinese mannerisms are very different i find them obnoxious myself because this guy would just walk into my bedroom whilst i was asleep in the morning and then turn on my computer games what? <laughs> and I, it was I mean, fine okay yeah <laughs> and i, I started yeah. wake up yeah had to be a control pad I was like, oh, okay fine we're playing computer I games like, now i feel like they they don't know what they don't seem to have boundaries like they just kind of you know like you said they just kind of walk into your room and like but to them, it's like normal. It's not. Yeah, yeah. It's not rude. It's just a, the etiquette and the what do you want to say the the perception of like other people is just very different. Yeah, um, yeah definitely. Yeah, it's the same everywhere, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. It was. Um... But yeah, weird, man. Like I was always in my head. I always knew that I'd be over here living. So do you, bizarre. Do you think? Do you think? that Japan was like your goal in terms of, 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 of being an English teacher or was it just kind of the opportunity no. came up? The thing about Japan was becoming a ninja <laughs> and so the only reason Japan was ever in the equation was because that's where the ninjas were from and so I'd do what I could to go and learn ninjutsu. Um, I actually took some ninjutsu classes at Salford Uni. They oh, had really? a oh, nice. yeah, camp in... <laughs> Uni. but that was the guy there wasn't very I don't think he was sensei material if you know what I mean he was fucking dick <laughs> <laughs> right he didn't have the, yeah. the, the kind of um, was it feng shui or the the calm he wasn't somebody you'd want to look up to <laughs> yeah he wasn't yeah okay he uh, didn't really have good life advice didn't really have um, a lot of the um what the figure that you need as like a mentor in something that's, yeah that's that's something that's really the kind of foundation of, of that kind of philosophy is like the the, the master and the disciple you know sensei well like it's just good guidance for young people i mean that was what was good about my aikido teacher was that he um because my dad died when i was young like nine years old or something mm. um i never really had a uh, like a, a male figure to like aspire to be, but he, mm. he, I don't want to say like he was like a dad figure or anything because he wasn't, but like, um, he was just somebody who was a geezer, a bit, a lot older, and would, was very, um, proper in like his influence on people. And Aikido is not a very like aggressive or even, active martial art but and i thought when i first saw it i was like yeah this is a bit gash and then mm. he knew straight away what i was thinking and he said to me and I, this is before i even had my first class he goes um i know this isn't what you were looking for but um the truth is if you haven't got what it takes um if you're not willing to bite somebody's fingers off in a real life fight it doesn't matter what you train um, here we're just learning etiquette, culture, and it's a social thing. And yeah, I just kind of took it for that and became good friends with everybody there and learned some Aikido. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's something I learned about like martial arts, like karate and stuff. It's like it's not about the actual getting into physical conversations and being able to fight. It's more about yeah. the mindset, the philosophy. That's what of... you learn about. That's the important stuff. Yeah. impact on my ego for sure 
Like, because when I was a kid, I was a fucking dickhead. <laughs> I think we all were. Like, just, yeah. just immaturity. Innit? Gobshot. Yeah. Same, same. Yeah. Just, so, um... Taiwan. Uh, gigs. Let's continue with music in Taiwan. Yeah, so I guess, let, well, let's talk about your, you know, your first few years there and then, and, and, you know, how, how was it? I mean, it's totally different culture, different language. Yeah. Cool. Everything is completely opposite. Of... It was just really cool because I didn't know what the fuck was going on. Couldn't understand what anyone was saying and the, nobody was going to ruin my day. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed the blissful ignorance for a, a while. And then, <clears throat> so I lived up in Keelung in a place that looked like Bramall Court. <clears throat> and then... You can't get away from Bramall Court. Right. But it, was, it, was, it was nice. I was by mm. the ocean. And <clears throat> so I dosed around for two years without doing anything. I had like a, I bought a Strat copy guitar from a night market for about 50 quid. I was just practicing like sixth songs or something. Um, <laughs> but then I got into <laughs> lower, it's like C, drop C sharp. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, but then I got into um, production, like Cubase, and because I learned Cubase at college and was getting into sound design just to keep my own musical interests alive if you know what yeah. i mean and then that's kind of how i kept myself busy musically thinking um so i moved to taijung and then i got into a band with a guy called boston paul who has been here for a while shout out to boston paul because he paul, put what his... a name love it <laughs> legend um <laughs> from boston obviously uh, <laughs> he um he was always he puts on his own music festivals cool yeah so we got to play a few of those and he also got us to play in different parts of taiwan so we got to see a lot more taiwan thanks to boston paul's bands and then so yeah, this would the... have been like 2013 2014 this would have been like 2015 or 16 okay more recent okay yeah um, and so and a lot of those gigs were paid somehow because you know th this is a, a problem for a musician gigging is getting paid um so he was very good at figuring out how you were going to get paid um, and was able to pull a few things off. And yeah, I don't know what he's up to these days, but I'm sure he's doing fine. And then nowadays I just play with myself. <laughs> well, we'll not get into that, but that's another podcast. Well, uh, <laughs> um, but so what was it? What's, what was it like playing, playing in Taiwan? I mean, what's it like playing there? What's the, you know, how does know, it compare? Like, is it? Do, not, you, do you have mosh pits it's, like loads of loads of Taiwanese like dudes like moshing and <laughs> you know Slipknot came here 2016. Sorry, say again. Came here in 2016 for the first time. Yeah, Slipknot. And, oh, Slipknot. Okay, yeah. That was at arena in Taipei, and I say arena. It was like a sports hall, and because I'm from where I'm from in Melton in Leicestershire, it's about half an hour away from Donington Park. Which is the big, um, like, metal musical music festival. Yeah, download festival. So I'd see Slipknot all the time there. And then they came to Taiwan, and it was, like, 200 people. Hmm. It was fucking weird, because I'm used to, like, what, 200 six... people seeing Slipknot? It was, like, Yeah. And they come on stage, and they're looking at me, like, okay, hey, guy. Um, I was like, this is so fucking weird, because they're, like, idols of mine. And 200 people? That's that's crazy. Wow, that they... 253 no more than 400 people yeah. and it was like tiered up it had like a the stairs thing imagine like um have you ever been to nottingham rock city uh no i haven't i know about it but i haven't no. yeah, it's about that size and yeah yeah dude it was just fucking bizarre to see them like that in that, in used that to... context yeah like used to just like thousands of people like in a huge yeah, stadium like download yeah exactly yeah looking at me because i'm the only white guy in the audience <laughs> like you <laughs> fucking yo you there <laughs> yeah yeah there's so, no mosh pits or anything it's like 
No mosh pits to at a Slipknot gig. What the fuck? <laughs> Different vibe here, dude. Um, there's some great yeah. bands though, like these bands. Um, just mention them. One's called Mixer. I like them. And then the other one is a pretty cool metal band called uh, Flesh Juicer. Flesh Juicer. <laughs> Tom, I like that. Um, Flesh Juicer. They um, <laughs> there's a a load of there is a scene, but it's kind of tiny and super low key you'd have no idea of where where these events happen there's only a few like venues around and it does it tend to just be like rock like metal rock kind of stuff you know, pop, death metal there's a really famous band here called chthonic and they play all over the world they they play the uk a lot um at the metal festivals like bloodstock they've been there a few times and i'm not a fan of death metal and but that's popular and most metal bands seem to have that kind of element to them, a death metal thing, which I'm not really a fan of. Mm-hmm. Um, they're different. They have a lot of like old school, um, traditional Taiwanese melody. <laughs> like, well, incorporated like, um, into like a metal. Yeah. Metal it wears a mask, like a pig mask. Yeah. And it's fucking cool. Um, I need to go see them because I haven't seen them yet. Um, but yeah, the, occasionally there's festivals. Um, what seems to happen is that there's always a festival somewhere. Maybe um, I'd say there's probably about five good festivals that happen a year. Mm. We can go to those. Um, I'm not sure if they're easy to get onto or whatever. But yeah, like local club scene and shit, there's, it's very, very scarce. But it, it is there. So like um, like your you, your smaller gigs they don't really exist, like like in the UK. They exist, but it's like I want to say it's probably like thirty percent of what it's like in the UK or was like in the UK. Don't know what it's like now with COVID. Oh well, <laughs> everything's on hold at the moment. So, um, but yeah, I guess yeah. it would it would you wouldn't be having all these like underground kind of gigs like house gigs and. You know, playing in like spoons and that, the, you know, in the back room, and that that doesn't exist. In there. It's like there's a few venues, and they're usually rammed every weekend because that's all there is. Yeah. So that yeah, that's there's not many yeah. choices. So, but um, like I said, the festivals. My friend Paul puts them on himself rents like a farmland in the mountains and build stages and it's fucking great. And then awesome, there's some like yeah. bigger like baseball stadiums and stuff. Um, and they have like international bands come through. Like, do you know Architects from Brighton, the metal band? No, I've not heard of them. I'm not into them. I'm not really into my metal, so probably doesn't. Yeah. They came a few years ago and they're quite a big name now in the metal world. But so, so you get the odd, the odd like big touring band stopping by. Yeah, they'll come to the festival, or if they're super big like Slipknot, they'd be able to get something like what they did, some kind of small stadium. It, it must was have weird. Been weird for them as well, like because they're used to playing, yeah, like huge rock stadiums, like sold out, and then. Mate, I guess. I guess because when I see yeah, it. There's one guy in the band. I'm not sure if it's because they're getting old, but like um, the one guy would come out into the audience and just have everybody if they weren't fucking moshing. And here he was just kind of like beside himself, like whether he was going to, what to do. So he was just prancing around the stage. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they were just kind of like, all right, we'll, we'll just do what we need to do and then get out of here. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't uh, really. I think they were totally not prepared for that. It's the first time they'd been. And... Right. Okay. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I guess they. I mean, I guess they play in other countries in in Asia, like yeah. China. They have their own music yeah. in Japan called Not Fest, and it's wild. Yeah, I mean, Japan's completely different yeah, to yeah. Taiwan, isn't it? Like. When I said I was playing with myself, um, <laughs> I still write a lot. And I've got probably like um, 
I've got at least one EP for a very specific project. I've got like four songs that are pretty much done, but I need yeah. like vocals and shit. Yeah. Um, so they're demo, I guess. And then there's one thing that I'd put out a while ago, which was dog shit. Um, but I've revamped that, and that's probably going to come out at some point in the next year. Big things happening next year. Shout Nothing out. big's happening. Yeah. I'll probably get it out in July or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I've just been learning mixing and like um, sound design and shit. Like I said, um, what's your plan for the future? Are you, I guess, are you music gonna, wise? Music wise, but also, are, are you going to stay stay in Taiwan for the foreseeable? You going well? Go- I'd like to be in a position where I could spend like six months in England and six months in Taiwan because I have an open work permit now. Um, oh, cool! So I don't have to piss about my immigration every year. Um, because I've been so long, um, so that would be ideal to just have a lot of time at home and a lot of time here. So we're gonna look aim for that somehow, and then music-wise, I'm not sure. I mean, I'd like to find a singer for these, this little demo that I've got, and then who knows? I don't want to say that I'm gonna go out gigging because, don't know, man. I think it's a waste of time. <laughs> I think just get it out online because everyone just consumes through phone now. Well, so obviously, gigs will always, shows will always have their place because you can't replicate that, you know, in any other way. You know, having that, being the, the you know, the energy, the fucking interaction. Yeah. and That's very stale here in all capacity. Like, I've seen some of the major pop stars, like, um, some of the I, shows I would, they I would have, hate like, that man if, if people were just standing there just not moving huge band here called Mayday I think one of them went to Manchester Uni for music um, that's what I heard anyway and they are like super pop band and they play like sold out Taipei Arena which is huge and from what I've seen of their videos everyone's got an LED baton and just doing this that's there's it. no like <laughs> that's so weird man like um community thing like uh you know no stage diving or crowd surfing or mosh pitting and those and they're super popular and they go on like they get hired to do like advertising for products and stuff like that they're pop stars um the music um there's nothing wrong with the music compositionally um but the the production on it is like they had a you know, like super compressed sound where everything's like squashed to the same level. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, like that was um, fine, and then they got everything together and then it's just shoved through a compressor again. <laughs> and yeah. it's just really but the not the songs, the songs are fine, but like. The way that the music feels dry, it's just, did you say? Really dry, yeah, like super dead. Like you could probably put it through a spectral analyzer, and it would just be like one wavelength for the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, overproduced seems to be the case these days. Um, so that's, um yeah, I don't know about Taiwan because we always have the issue with China, um, whether they're gonna invade at some point, um, and I'm not living under commie China. So, so I'll probably you'll... be back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The deal. I'll probably go um try and figure out how to do uh six months on, six months off. Not even that, just like have the connection still. Because I've missed so much stuff back home. Like a lot of people died, like in my family, and I've not been able to go to funerals or anything. Oh, really? It's real fucking shit. Do you mean um, like really recently because due yeah. due to COVID? They've just um unfortunate accident and then just age and yeah, these are very important people in my family because we have a deep irish connection i'm half irish um so there's uh family's very close that way um yeah, yeah, yeah. so to not be at any of their like special occasions like funerals or weddings and stuff's kind of I don't know it leaves me a bit sore sometimes you know yeah 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 uh, so there's that reason. 
and because we're all getting older, um, and it's been fucking eight years. <laughs> it's a long time. It's insane. I think I think we've I think we've probably covered most most things, and um, yeah, it's um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks for. Uh... I had a question. Yes. So so this so this guy we mentioned, Davy Balchin. Um, he's a he's a friend of John T's and. I met him a few times. Cool guy, and he had, he he posted a question um, on Facebook, and the question was, I've had to I've kind of rephrased it because I want to you know want to make this PC yeah, right? <laughs> how <laughs> how did you meet Claire? <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> he wants. Oh to yeah, meet. I remember that. And else, didn't he? Yeah, Bang. yeah, but it was more like a bit more kind of uh, garish, let's say, the way he phrased it. <laughs> uh, yeah, just fear and intimidation. Fear and intimidation, yeah. Uh, she was on sale in the supermarket. <laughs> 20 quid, not bad. <laughs> 20 quid, no, where yeah. did I meet her? Oh, exchange website. Because um, I made had the intention of... Um, I actually did this before I even went to Taiwan. I'd mm. gone on... So I was like, had the plan of going, booked my ticket and stuff, and then was like, let's do some language exchange stuff. And she was on there, and yeah, so that was hung out a few you, times. That was before you moved to Taiwan. You kind of made some connections, and then yeah, <clears throat> and it nice. turns out she was a student. She had all the time in the world, and then yeah, just hung out a load, and she got me around Taiwan a bit. Went down to she was living in Kaohsiung. And I went down there to visit and did some cool shit. And then, yeah, just eventually kind of sealed the deal. Fear and intimidation. <laughs> Duly noted. Um, and I don't know he's asking. He's married now. He's married. He's tied the knot. Okay. should be trying to figure that out, Dave. <laughs> You're already married. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Cool, Rick. The only question... Of the uh, our Q and A section of this podcast, but um, yeah, thanks, yeah, thanks so much, and thanks, Rick. good to see you, man. Mm-hmm.